before I actually begin, while we're waiting for maybe a couple other people to come in, what I'm actually going to do is give you a little glimpse into my mindfulness practice. And it may not make sense to you right now, but maybe it will as we go on. So as I mindfully tune into what's going on inside of me right now, I realize my voice is quivering, my legs are shaky, my hands are sweaty, and my mind is kind of has thoughts of wanting to run away. No way. <laughs> you don't perceive it. Anyway, and I know that this comes from the fact that when I was a child and a, and a teenager, I dreaded talking before a group. It was absolute torment. In fact, I avoided proms, graduations, parties, everything because I wasn't comfortable being around people in a, particularly in a performance setting. I only learned one place to be able to do that and that was playing baseball because my dad made me. But the point I'm trying to make is right now there's a lot going on inside of me and it's coming from my lower brain. It's coming from what I call the automatic programming. The, um, I also call it the lizard brain. It's where we carry the wounds of our childhood. The traumas, the losses, the fears, everything. It's the part of the brain that's supposed to protect us. But this part of the brain doesn't really have any sense that I'm an adult now and you guys aren't bullies. You know, all it knows is a group of people get the hell out of here. <laughs> so there's a struggle going on with me, within me right now. It's not much of a struggle because I've done enough of these now and I'm mindful enough that I can recognize this as what my brain does in these situations. There's a stimulus and a response. A bunch of people go the other way. But I have a mindful brain too, right here behind my forehead. It's the mid prefrontal cortex. And this part of the brain sees things as they are in the here and now. And what it sees is my body's very nervous telling me to run, run, run. But as I look around here, I don't see any guns. Knives, tornadoes, hurricanes, bears. And my mind here says, you're safe. This is all a false alarm. Therefore, I can feel the fear and do it anyway. Now, we all have what I call past programming, wounded child programming, lizard brain activity. That is just what our mind does in certain situations. And if you do like I did for many decades, allowed that part to rule my life, then I'm a prisoner to my own brain. As a sacred Hindu text says, for he who has tamed the mind is the best of friends, but for he who has not, it's the worst of enemies. So mindfulness is about taming the mind. It's about taming the mind so you can be the person you want to be, and you can live in the here and now, and if you live in the here and now, and see things as they are, as opposed to how your wounded mind's telling you they are, Three things happen. Your stress goes down, you feel more emotionally in control, and you take care of yourself better. You make better decisions for yourself. And, but I will say this, if you really take an interest in learning to practice mindfulness, it will change your life. I started learning about mindfulness about 15, 16 years ago when I read a book by John Kabat-Zinn, who I'll talk about more later, called Full Catastrophe Living. And what that book did was not only change the way I live personally, but it changed the way I view therapy as a therapist. I no longer really think that much in terms of diagnosis. What I do think of in terms of how people handle stress. And there are ways of handling stress that are effective, and there are ways people handle stress that are not effective. We call that maladaptive coping. So that's what I'm going to talk about tonight, about how mindfulness can help you handle stress in a much more effective way, and not only improve the quality of your life, but improve your ability to take care of yourself. So the actual official definition that John Kabat-Zinn gave to mindfulness is the awareness that arises from paying attention on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally, to things as they are. The awareness that rises from paying attention on purpose, intentionally, in the present moment, right here, right now. Non-judgmentally, meaning not in judging anything as good or bad, but just observing and accepting what is right now as to what's happening right here, right now. And that's what I was explaining what's going on with me. 
you say, I don't look like I'm nervous, but I am nervous. But I'm also mindful enough to know it's a false alarm, so I don't have to act on it, I don't have to buy into it, I don't have to believe it. I talk a lot about mindfulness, how to deal with difficult emotions, difficult pain in your life, grief, addiction. But on the other side, which you won't talk so much about, when you live mindfully, you savor everything. You savor every bite of your food, you savor every moment with your child. Mindfulness means being fully present to what's here right now. And in the good things in life, the things we call good, it means I'm not with my kid but up in my head thinking about something else. I'm right here fully with the kid, I'm fully with my meal, I'm fully with the music, I'm fully with my work. Wherever I am, I'm right here right now. It's really the opposite of multitasking. So not only will mindfulness help you deal with stressful times, but it will enhance the good times and make them more enriched. Now, what I want to explain is how mindfulness came to be what it is today, which is that um, if you had to check the research journals a couple of decades ago, you would have found very little about mindfulness. And now it's massively everywhere. Everyone's researching mindfulness for everything you can imagine in terms of physical and mental health. It's kind of, it's kind of a new wave. And it was all started because of the research of John Kabat-Zinn, and I'll basically explain what he did. Is he set up a stress reduction clinic in uh, University of Massachusetts Medical School, and he had people re being, who were referred to him from the doctors in the community who were basically stressed out by life. They had things like cancer, age, chronic pain, um, post-traumatic stress, just people who their doctors recognized were completely stressed out. So they would come to his clinic two hours a week for eight weeks. And everything was done in a group setting. Nothing he taught them was geared towards the individual or any individual diagnosis. And then he tested them initially, afterwards, and for two years after. And to see how well what he taught them helped them with their stress levels. It was called the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Clinic. And what he found is that even up to two years later, 80% of the people that completed his eight-week course would say things like, I still have the cancer, it just doesn't bother me as much anymore. I still have the post-traumatic stress, it just doesn't bother me as much anymore. I still have the chronic pain, it just doesn't bother me as much anymore. And it, it's really simplistic to say this, but in, in one sense, he was only teaching them one thing. I mean, the big umbrella is he taught them mindfulness, but what he really taught them to do is not to live in their thoughts. And again, when you think of our brain, we have two kinds of thoughts. We have what I call me thinking. This is if I want to drive to Boston, I can go to my laptop, Google in a few words, find MapQuest, find out how to get to Boston. That's me using my mind as a tool. But what happens to people is there's another kind of thought. It comes from the lower brain, the lizard brain, the wounded child part of your brain, the part that's supposed to keep us safe. And that part, pretty much fills the void with chatter all the time. So if you're a person who can kind of get through the day okay, but then when you go to bed at night, all of a sudden you can't sleep because all this stuff comes up, that's what I'm talking about. It's just what your mind does. It's automatic thinking. It's not something you can really control. You can't really make it go away easily. In fact, Cabot Zinn says, don't even try. Just recognize it for what it is. It's just what your mind does, and then don't focus on it. Focus on something in the here and now. So what he taught people to do is tame the mind. And in taming the mind, the stress reduced. Why? Because he believed, and I believe it's true too, most of the stress in life comes from our own thinking. I went to a workshop recently, and they basically said that research had shown that a moment, a moment is five seconds long. Now, how they determine that, I don't know. But I'll buy it. I'll say, okay, so you did some research and you figured out on moments. That means there's 12 moments in a minute. And then there's so many moments in an hour and there's so many moments in a day. Think about the last 24 hours. Think about every single moment you've had. How many of the moments were horrible? Horrendous. And I'm sure there may have been some. How many of the moments were either okay, blah, manageable, or even good. What most people will say, well, in the last 24 hours, there really wasn't any catastrophes. 
you know, there was boring moments, there was fun moments, there was disappointing moments, but there was no catastrophes. But on the other hand, if you're living in your lower brain with what if this and what if that, what if this and what if that, or you're beating yourself up constantly, I'm a horrible person, I'm a failure, no one could ever like me, or you're always feeling like life's out to get you and angry because you feel like, you know, the coworker wants to get you, everybody wants to do me harm. It's like being in a movie where you're miserable all the time because you can't walk out of the theater. Because it's a theater you're creating, it's a story you're creating in your mind. So that's what he taught them what to do, and that's how they reduce the stress. And it's pretty simple. It's a simple concept. But it's not easy to do, which is why mindfulness isn't something you learn to do like tying a shoe. You know, I think once I've tied a shoe, I don't think I have to spend the rest of my life learning how to tie a shoe. But if I'm learning how to play a guitar, I may spend the rest of my life learning how to play a guitar. And if I'm learning mindfulness, I hope I spend the rest of my life learning mindfulness. Because it's something you learn from every day by working on staying fully present in the here and now and being very mindful of not getting stuck in what I call stinking thinking. If you look at this page here, the diagram of the human being, the book Full Catastrophe Living was basically written to the world as a discussion of what he, how he did his research and what he learned from it. And this is an incredible summary of it that if you really understand what this is saying, um, again, it can change your life. So if you look at the top, it says external stress events, internal stress events. Internal stress events are things like perfectionism, codependency, depression, things that come from within me. External stress events are things like the weather, other people, things external to me. So we're always dealing with external and internal stress events. Now, stress isn't a bad thing. If there was no stress in life, it would be very boring which what happens to sometimes people who only know how to work and when they retire they have nothing interesting or challenging to do and they just kind of die. So we do need a certain amount of stress, but we also don't want to be stressed out. But what happens, and if you go down the left side of this diagram, where it says perception, appraisal, fight or flight, alarm, reactivity, when we get to the point where life feels like it's attacking us, like we feel under siege by the demands on us, when we can't relax, we can't sleep, it means we're stressed out or we're getting stressed out. And when you're stressed out, it's very similar to fight or flight. Well, the good thing about fight or flight is it's a natural system the body has to protect us. If I'm walking down the canal and a mother bear with a cub comes along and starts getting nasty towards me, I rightly need to get in fight or flight. So if I go into fight or flight, in a very simplistic way, it means that my the blood and oxygen go to my limbs so I can fight or flight and away from my organs. If I'm in chronic fight or flight because I feel under siege by life every day, then what's happening to my organs over time? They're being malnourished. I will develop heart problems, stomach problems, brain problems, depression. If you're chronically stressed out, it will affect your body because it's a physical thing. It's a physical change in the body. So if you go down farther down the left side, it says internalization, the stress reaction. So now I've got the heart racing a little bit, your pulse is up, you know, you're getting back aches, headaches, because your body's chronically in fight or flight, so you're in a dysregulation. That arrow that points back to the body means that's now become another stressor. Because what's happening here on the left side is the person who is experiencing this is denying the stress. They're just sucking it up and deciding just to pretend it's not there and keep pushing on, pushing on, pushing on. Even though their body's telling them, you gotta settle down, you gotta relax, you can't keep doing this. So a lot of people, when they get to that point, they use maladaptive coping as another way to pretend they're not stressed out. What is maladaptive coping? Overworking. Every time I feel stressed, I just get busy. Hyperarousal, just keep moving. How many of you don't stop moving from the time you get up to the time you go to bed? And then you get in bed and, I can't sleep. Overeating, you know, the comfort of a chocolate cake or, you know, this Rocky Road ice cream. I keep doing that to distract myself from my body pain. Drugs, alcohol, cigarettes, caffeine, food. So the thing about a stress reaction cycle, and that's what we're talking about, around the left side, 
the way I'm dealing with stress is not responding to it, but I'm reacting to it. And the way I'm reacting is actually creating more stress. So I've created a stress producing engine and that finally leads to breakdown. Physical, psychological exhaustion, loss of drive, enthusiasm, depression, genetic predispositions, heart attack, cancer. So what I've done is because I'm stressed out and because the very things I'm doing to cope with the stress is causing more stress, in the short run, yeah, chocolate cake gives me some relief. In the long run, it creates a problem. Same thing with all these things. In the short run, they give relief. That's why people do it. But in the long run, they create problems. So that's when people end up in the hospital. They end up on the psych ward. Because what happens, literally, is your body and mind are telling you something. You can't keep doing this. I'm going to shut you down until you figure out a better way. I'm not going to participate in this anymore. And that's when the depressed person can't get out of bed or the other person's body just starts falling apart. So your body is talking to you. And what Cabot Zinn said is we have to pay attention to our body. Our body is where we carry the emotion and the stress, and if we don't pay attention to it, if we pretend we don't have a body, then we can lead to breakdown. At worst, if you don't break down, it becomes a short circuit that just drags all the life out of life, and you're just going through the motions. As he says on this very front page here, this cycle of a stressor triggering a stress reaction of some kind, often accompanied by an internalizing of the stress reaction, leading to inadequate or maladaptive attempts to keep things under control, leading to more stressors, more stress reactions, and ultimately to an acute breakdown in health, perhaps even to death, is a way of life for many of us. When you are caught up in this vicious cycle, it seems like it is just the way life is, that there is no other way. You might think to yourself that this is a normal part of getting older, or a normal decline in health, or a normal loss of energy, or enthusiasms, or feelings of control. But getting stuck in a stress reaction cycle is neither normal nor inevitable. We have far more options and resources for facing our problems than we usually know we have. The healthy alternative to being caught up in the self-destructive pattern is to stop reacting to stress and start responding to it. So look at the right side of the diagram. So what he taught people is how to respond to stress instead of react to it. And that's why the quality of their life improved. So it says mindfulness, appraisal of thoughts, feelings, perceived threats, awareness, re reaction. So what it means is as I go through my day-to-day -day life as a therapist, I'm gonna have stressful times. It's part of life and that's not the problem. The problem is I don't know how to deal with the stress. So when I, when I find myself feeling stressed out, I have two choices. I can pretend it's not there, pretend what's happening isn't happening, isn't that what an alcoholic does? They pretend that they're not destroying their lives when they are. Or I can say, wow, look at my body. You know, I'm tense. My heart's racing. I'm having all kinds of racing thoughts. I'm feeling overwhelmed. What can I do? So what mindfulness is about, and I encourage all of you to do this, is building check in points throughout the day to just kind of take a scan and see how you're doing. And if you find there's tension in your body, do a little stretching or exercise. If your mind's racing, maybe do a little meditation, which we may do one if we have time. If your emotions are really boiling about something, maybe talk to someone about it. The point is, is instead of letting the stress just build, 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 pretending it's not there until finally you crash and break down, your day looks like this. I feel some stress. I acknowledge it. I deal with it. And this is my life. When the stress comes up to a certain point and I'm aware of it, I do something about it. And I, learn, and I get more and more skilled, one, at paying attention mindfully, and two, at knowing how to intervene to de-stress myself. And that's what I try to teach clients to do. I'm just going to read something that's not in the handout, but it's from a book that is in, in the last page. It's the, on the resources page. There's a book called The Mindful Way Through Depression. So this is a good explanation of what mindfulness is as far as dealing with difficult emotions. Mindfulness is the awareness that arises from paying attention on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally to things as they are. It's a way of shifting from doing to being 
so that we take in all the information that an experience offers us before we act. Being mindful means that we suspend judgment for a time, set aside our immediate goals for the future, and take in the present moment as it is rather than as we would like it to be. It means we approach situations with openness, even if we notice that it brings up feelings such as fear. Being mindful means intentionally turning off the automatic pilot mode in which we operate so much of the time, brooding about the past, for instance, or worrying about the future, and instead tuning into things as they are in the present with full awareness. It means knowing that our thoughts are passing mental events, not reality itself, and that we are more in touch with life as it is when we allow ourselves to experience things through the body and through our senses rather than mostly through our unexamined and habitual thoughts. So just to give you a couple of examples, um, so when I work with people who have a lot of anxiety, you know, they have panic attacks, they have anxiety, and people that have anxiety back themselves in a corner by continually avoiding situations that create anxiety, like me avoiding talking before groups. You know, and as long as I, for whatever reason, if I have a fear of talking before groups, if I spend my life avoiding it, I will always have that fear. Because whatever caused that fear, it could have been growing up in an alcoholic family or maybe being bullied or teased, it makes no difference. Whatever caused that initial fear, my lower brain learned to the stimulus of people, run, avoid. On the other hand, if I mindfully am able to say, you guys don't look so bad, I think I can talk to you. I don't think you're gonna eat me alive. I think I can do this. If I feel the fear and do it anyway, then what happens is that initially to the stimulus of talking to a group of people on a balance scale, the heavy weight is run. That's my programming, that's my old programming. Get the hell out of here, leave, it's dangerous. But suppose I do one lunch or learn, that's gonna, and it goes okay, which it always has. Sometimes better, sometimes worse, but it's never terrible. So now what's happened is that pathway of danger compared to a pathway of safety changes a smidgen. Now that I have one experience where my brain, my lower brain, which doesn't learn very quickly, suppose I do it five times, 10 times, 50 times, 100 times. What's happened is I've literally reprogrammed my brain to the stimulus of a group of people, which used to terrify me, now it just makes me anxious. And I don't run, I used to run, now I don't run anymore. And this is how you can use mindfulness as a way to reprogram pretty much any pattern you have in your life that isn't working for you. You know, um, when I think about the programming down in the lower brain, there's basically two main parts of it. There's shame and there's fear. If you have shame, for example, it means you feel bad about yourself, you feel inadequate, but you don't feel good enough. How does your shame affect you today? Well, if it doesn't affect you today, it's not an issue. But someone who grew up in an alcoholic family as a child develops shame quite naturally, meaning they blame themselves, feel inadequate, feel no one could love them, or they don't feel worthwhile. So what do they do? They avoid taking risk for fear of failure. They only get involved with people with low self-esteem and have all kinds of problematic relationships because they feel like if they get someone who's healthy that it won't work. So basically, these, this lower program can literally be a prison that we're stuck in. And only if you're willing to mindfully face it are you able to do that. So what I say to clients that have, for example, a lot of anxiety is you have to embrace the anxiety. And what I mean by embrace it is stop fighting it, stop running from it, and get to know it. Put your, allow yourself to little by little go into situations that get outside your comfort zone and observe what happens. What happens when you get around a group of people you don't know? What happens to your body? What happens to your thoughts? What happens to your emotions? What do you actually see right before your very eyes? Make a column. On this column, this is what I see, and this is what my mind's telling me. See how they fit together. Which part do you want to listen to? Which part's going to be the one that you listen to and let make the decisions in your life? Is it going to be your mindful brain or your wounded child brain? So mindfulness literally allows you to reprogram your brain. Tame the mind and reprogram the brain. So how do you bring mindfulness into your life? One thing I would recommend is The Mindful Way Through Depression. And the reason I recommend this book is not because of the depression part. You may be depressed or you may not. 
everyone has felt depressed at times. But what this book teaches you is how to live a mindful life, and specifically the examples involve depression and some about anxiety. But, what you, but it's a nuts and bolts book. It's, there's a lot of books about philosophy, about the importance of living in the now. I'm sure some of you have read books about living in the now. The problem is they don't tell you how to live in the now. They just say it's living the now is a good thing. This book actually has you practicing living in the now. For example, therapists love to say, well, Patty, you just have to let go of it. Right? But do they tell you how? Well, mindfulness shows you how to practice it every single day, how to literally go to the gym to learn how to let go of thinking. So what I like about this book, and I recommend it to anybody that's interested, is that, you know, you get the book, you work the program, they're going to ask you to do mindful experiments, do some mindful meditations, do those things, and what you'll find, and it's a book, it's not the, it's not the kind of book that you just read and put back on a shelf, and as you start incorporating more mindfulness into your life, you'll find that things start to shift. You find that you're enjoying pleasures more, and you're dealing with the stressful times better. You're more relaxed, you're more able to just be without feeling like you have to do something to self-medicate or distract, distract yourself from it. With this book comes a CD of about six or seven mindfulness meditations. And I want to explain what a mindfulness meditation is. It's not emptying your mind, because that's not possible. It's not communing with God or transcending duality. It's not meant to be religious. I'm not saying it can't be a spiritual experience, but that's not the purpose of it. The purpose of mindfulness meditation is to tame the mind. By having you practice on a regular basis, doing these meditations and learning from the experience, getting to know your mind in an intimate way, getting to really see how your mind has a mind of its own, understanding the difference between me thinking and just what my mind does in certain situations. And as a result of all that you experience doing this, you find that you're able much more to live in the here and now. So what I'm going to do right now is we're going to do a mindfulness meditation. Narrated by John Kabat-Zinn. He's, he's the one who's guiding the meditation. So establishing yourself now in a sitting posture that embodies wakefulness and dignity, either cross-legged on a suitable cushion and mat on the floor, or on a meditation bench or a straight-back chair, allowing your head and neck to be balanced on your shoulders and the whole of the torso to be erect but not stiff, placing your hands on your knees or together in your lap in a comfortable way, and allowing your shoulders to be relaxed and dropped. Letting your pelvis provide a stable base to support your upper body, aware of the sensations of contact with the cushion or the chair. In other words, as best you can, sitting with the qualities of a mountain, fully present in the body, stable, grounded, and with an element of uplift to the posture itself. And when you're ready, becoming aware of the fact that you're breathing, bringing your attention to the belly as it expands with the in-breath and deflates with the out-breath, or to the passage of air in and out at the nostrils, or anywhere else that the breath sensations are accessible and vivid for you, and just feeling the breath coming into the body and leaving the body. riding on the waves of the breath sensations with your full attention as best you can, moment by moment by moment, and breath by breath by breath as we sit here, in touch as best you can be with the full duration of each breath coming into the body 
and the full duration of each breath leaving the body, feeling the breath sensations as they flux and change moment by moment by moment. It's best if you can stay with the breath at a particular location in the body for an entire practice period. So if you start with the belly or with the nostrils, then the suggestion is to stay with the breath sensations in that region rather than to jump around. In that way, we are cultivating a greater intimacy and familiarity with the breath and a greater stability of attention. So just letting each breath come and go of its own accord, feeling the sensations of the breath moving in and out, moment by moment by moment. Of course, you may rapidly discover that it's not so easy to keep your attention on the breath. It doesn't take long to realize that just as in the body scan, the mind has a life of its own and will invariably take off into the past or the future, planning or worrying, liking or disliking, daydreaming or reverie, impatience or boredom, or even sleepiness. This is totally normal and not a problem at all. When you notice that your mind is no longer on the breath, then noticing what is on your mind in that moment, and then gently letting go of whatever it is, which doesn't mean pushing it away, but just recognizing it and letting it be, as we escort our attention back to the belly or to the nostrils, back to this breath, whether it's an in-breath or an out-breath. And once again, re-establishing the breathing center stage in the field of awareness. And if the mind wanders away from the breath a hundred times, as it surely will, each and every time when we become aware that it is someplace else, we gently and patiently note what is on our mind in this moment, whatever it is, perhaps even making a light mental note such as thinking, thinking, or planning, planning, or worrying, worrying, and without being harsh or critical or judging of ourselves, we simply recognize what is arising for what it is and let it be as we come back to feeling this breath in this moment and begin again and again and again, each time for the first time, each moment the only moment, since our lives are unfolding here and now and only here and now, no matter what our thoughts are telling us. Since it's in the nature of the mind to wander, it's not that you are failing at meditation if your mind doesn't stay on the breath. It's that you're discovering something exceedingly important about the nature of the mind itself, and that is that it waves, just as the ocean waves. So it's never a matter of putting a stop to it, trying to shut off your thinking or make your mind go blank, but rather familiarizing yourself with the nature and the ways of your own mind and cultivating a deeper intimacy with it through gentle observation, grounded in an awareness that is bigger than thinking, and wiser than thinking, and usually kinder than thinking, an awareness that grows out of our bringing the mind back to the breath gently but firmly over and over and over again, allowing each in-breath to be a new beginning and each out-breath a complete letting go. So sitting here now, mountain-like, fully awake, 
with a light touch, resting in awareness, not forcing anything. But as best we can, being fully in touch moment by moment with the breath as it comes into the body and as it leaves the body. And coming back over and over again when we lose touch with it momentarily as we stay here sitting. Soon you will hear the sound of a bell to signal the end of this segment of the sitting meditation practice. Please use the sound of the bell to mindfully bring this period of formal practice to a close. So as I... Um let you have another glimpse into my uh, mindfulness practice. Right now my body feels very different than it did when I came in. I was all hyped up, now I'm feeling more relaxed. Did anybody not feel relaxed? Anybody feel stressed by that? What did anybody experience? Relaxing. Relaxing. Peaceful. I want to, go ahead. Peaceful. Peaceful, yeah. And I want to talk about six benefits of mindfulness meditation. One of the benefits is it's relaxing. And, but that's really the least important one because there's lots of ways to relax. But it is good. It's a very relaxing thing. I do this with clients in the office. I do this with groups like this. And I always love doing it. It always resets me. It always grounds me back to the present. Gets me out of my head. Second thing is that when you're doing this and you become aware that you've been distracted by what I call the automatic program thinking, the stuff that just fills the void, that just automatically comes up. It's not me thinking, it's just what my mind does. I'm learning to tell the difference between me thinking and these thoughts that just pop up. And imagine how good that would be for you if you were able to distinguish between helpful thinking and just what your mind does. Because most people don't even think there is, they don't, they're not aware of any difference. They think all thoughts are equal, that just because I think it, it must be true, I must pay attention to it, it must be important. The third benefit, and this is pretty astonishing, is when I said about, Patty, you just have to let go of it. Every time when you're doing this, you become aware that your mind's been distracted by any thought at all, negative thought, positive thought, neutral thought. And the instruction is simply, maybe give it a quick label, worry, planning, so you can kind of see what your mind's doing, and then escort your attention back to your breathing. It's like literally going to the gym to exercise the muscles of letting go of stinking thinking. Imagine how helpful that would be for any of us if we could let go of stinking thinking. The stuff that just wears us down like a short circuit and drains our energy and depresses us and stresses us and scares us. The fourth benefit is that the more you do this, the more you really come to know in a very intimate way how your mind works. You know, we try to fix our minds, but we don't know what the hell we're doing because we don't really observe our minds. To me, it's like if I have something wrong with my car, I take it to the mechanic. He does not just start ripping things apart. What does he do? He observes it. What he does is just see how it's operating, see what's going on, see how it all fits together. And once he observes it enough and sees how everything fits together, then he says, ah, I think this might fix it. That's what mindfulness is. It's about getting to know your brain so that you see how your brain works so that you can make better choices about what part of your brain to listen to. The fifth benefit, and this is really astonishing, this is new research. They've now been doing fMRIs, MRIs specifically for the brain that really show detailed brain activity, that show that practicing mindful meditation grows your mid prefrontal cortex. It makes it more developed. And if you have a strong, powerful mid prefrontal cortex, which, by the way, is the highest part of our brain, 
and our brain is the most complex thing known that we know of in the universe. So this is the most evolved part of the most evolved thing we know of in the universe. Right between your skull. It's right here. Amazing. So it actually grows. It actually makes it thicker, more developed. And the more you're able to step back and see things as they are, as opposed to listen to what your wounded automatic mind is telling you, the better choices you're going to make. I was talking to a military guy about this, playing mindfulness. He says, oh, you mean the helicopter view. I said, what do you mean? He says, the view you get with a helicopter where you can see the whole picture, as opposed to being caught up in all the details. He sa I said, yeah, that's it. It's the helicopter view. It's the mindful view. And the last benefit, the sixth benefit, is just a practical one, is that mindfulness is not that complicated. We are all being mindful right now, every one of us. You know, what we were doing is pay attention to our breathing. When we got distracted, we were bringing our attention back. It's not that complicated. But it's hard to remember to do. It's hard to remember to bring it into your life. It's hard to remember in stressful times that it's an option. So what I say is that if you do it every day on a regular basis, it at least increases the chances that on that day, you're going to remember mindfulness is an option. You know, and, and I'm just going to give you an example. Go to the doctor, and he's going to do a test, and in two weeks I'm going to find out whether I have cancer or not, or some horrible disease. <laughs> so if I'm a mindless person, if I live in this part of my brain, I will probably be thinking about it practically 24-7 for the next two weeks, all the what-ifs and imagining this and imagining that, and not sleeping. So in that two weeks' time, Whatever health I was in to begin with, I'm going to be in worse health because I'm going to be totally stressed out, not sleeping. So whatever the results are, my body's already gone downhill because I'm not taking care of myself. I'm not eating, I'm just stressed. Now, if I'm a mindful person and handle that same situation in a mindful way, it's a stressful situation. I can't deny it. I'm going to be stressed. But what can I do to make sure I don't bring more stress to it than already is there. In other words, the stress of my own thinking. Well, if mindfulness meditation is the structured or formal practice of mindfulness, then mindfulness is life as a meditation. Mindfulness is life as a meditation. What I mean by that is, so here I am, the doctor told me that, I'm stunned, I'm going through all kinds of emotions, but because I'm mindful, I don't fight my emotions, but I don't obsess on them. I let them come and let them go, let things settle down as best I can. And then my goal becomes for the next two weeks that when I find my mind going, just like in the med meditation, going to that, what if this and what if that, I say to myself, is there anything I can do about it right now? And if there is, I do it. And if there isn't, I say I need to get back to the present. If I'm with my kids, I'm with my kids. If I'm with my wife, I'm with my wife. If I'm at work, I'm at work. If I'm watching a movie, I'm watching a movie. I need to keep bringing myself back. And of course, the more I've been practicing this as part of my mindfulness practice, the more successful I will be and the less stressed I'll be in the process. So what does that mean? Is that going to change the outcome of the test? Probably not. In fact, it's not. The outcome's going to be the outcome. But whatever the outcome is, I'm going to be healthier.